indeed a great pleasure to me and an honor to be here with you tonight. I'm very happy to be back in Texas, even though I enjoyed very much the 20 years that I spent in Tennessee. And a part of me, I suppose, will, part of my heart will always be in Tennessee, but I feel that I'm back home now in Texas and enjoying more than I could possibly explain being a member of the Siegelville congregation and getting to hear the weak preaching of Brother Andrew Conley every Lord's Day. <laughs> it's a great congregation there, great eldership, and really it's a pleasure to me to hear somebody preach as Brother Conley does every Lord's Day. I've been given a topic that is indeed of great importance, and I can only hope that I even partially can give the credence to it that belongs. After I had turned this manuscript in and was giving some thought, and even though for many years I have been in universities and sat at the feet of professors who taught the ungodly doctrine of atheism with its attendant form for the public of humanism. That's all humanism is. It's just giving a name to atheism uh, so that it's more palatable to the average person out here in the world. And things going on in our public education all the way from kindergarten through the doctorate level of the university graduate school. But it occurred to me that uh, Brother Whitten had not exactly explained or confined me to public education. And I want tonight at least to touch on the fact that we as members of the church need to be concerned about the training that goes on in our own schools, if I can say our own schools, Christian colleges. Christian academies, and schools where preachers are trained. We need to be deeply and vitally concerned that what we support is sound in the faith. Now, brethren, let me warn you that history records the fact that churches can be led into practically wholesale apostasy because of what occurs in schools. I read just the other day from a man who has an earned doctorate from one of the great universities in Europe, make the point, quoting another man, that societies are largely carried along. What happens in societies are what happens are the result of what happens in its educational system. I often take the time when I am in conversations with people to casually bring up questions about education to see how people feel about it, what they think it is, what they think it ought to be doing, where they think it ought to be going, if it's going all right, and if it isn't, what should be done about it. The reaction which I have had from such conversations is the average person gives very little thought to the educational process of this country, gives very little thought to what goes on in the schools which we, as members of the church, operate, I mean our brethren, of all kinds, whatever kind there is to train people supposedly under a Christian atmosphere. There's something far more to a Christian atmosphere than to simply announce that you are a Christian college and that you propose to follow Christ. There are people everywhere who say they are following Christ who are not following Christ. I want to plead with you tonight to recognize that what this comes down to, values clarification, is simply the arm of humanism reaching out into the public schools to get over a form of ethical system that is completely antagonistic to God. Now, with all of my heart, I pray that if you had not known that before, 
that you make it a part of your thinking. In Matthew 21, we have the record of the Jewish leaders coming to Jesus and asking him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Jesus did not say, as many would have us to do today, Well, now you're a good and honest fellow, and I'm a good and honest fellow, so let us simply get together for six months or a year or two years and get to know one another and be good buddies and see what will come out of that. The Lord immediately said, you answer a question for me, and then I'll answer your question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? This is another way of saying, was it from God or was it from men? That's another way of saying, was it from God or was it from not from God? Those are the only two alternatives. From God or not from God. There are no other possibilities. Everything in the world is either black or it isn't black. Everything in religion is either from God or it isn't. These men got off to the side and reasoned and said, if we say that John's baptism, his preaching, was from God, then he'll say, then why didn't you believe him? You see, they could reason it. There wasn't any trouble with that. I have a lot of people tell me, oh, I just have a lot of trouble with logical reasoning. I have found that three and four year old children are very logical and that I cannot deceive them about obvious logical things. I have a five year old grandson. He's a real good logician. Everybody is, as a matter of fact. The Bible is written in a logical way. If it weren't, you couldn't make any sense out of it. So they said, we can't say John, John's baptism was from God. But on the other hand, if we say simply from men, then we are afraid of the people because they hold he's a prophet. So they said, we can't answer either way. So what can we do? We just go back and say we don't know. You see now what the Lord did was use a dilemma. He stuck out two horns for them and said, all right, you get yourself on one of them or the other because you can't escape in between. And if you will study the life of Jesus, with any real attention, you'll find that all the way through he was doing this. Always putting men to the point that they must face up to the truth. There was no mealy-mouthing around about it. And nobody in this world ever loved people as did our blessed Lord. I am sick to death of people implying that if you try to force the issue as to whether a thing is right or wrong, true or false, that this proves you are not a loving person. The devil has no bigger lie than that because to convince the church of that would simply rip its insides out so that it quits opposing the truth and proclaiming uh, error, and proclaiming the truth and opposing error. Values clarification has to do then, as I'm suggesting, with are you going to follow man and God? In the public discussion which I had with Dr. Wallace I. Matson, a world-renowned scholar who is an atheist, a humanist, an atheistic humanist. I take it all of us are humanists in the sense that we're concerned about humans and I'm not willing to take any back seat to any secular humanist to be more concerned about mankind than I am or God's people as a whole. But I indicated and pleaded with the audience to realize what is happening to American education. And Dr. Matson, ordinarily fairly well controlled, became angry. I could tell he was angry. He got up and said, I'll fight you, Dr. Warren. I'll fight you on this. To try to call to Americans to come back and make out of our public school system what it ought to be. I'll tell you what it's coming to be. It's coming to be a hotbed of atheism. It's coming to be a place where evolution is taught, where children are taught they're simply descendants of apes and other non-human things. But humanism is nothing new, and the sort of approach to morals, to ethical systems, that is manifested by present-day values clarification is nothing new. We go back to several hundred years before Christ. We find the same kind of things among the ancient Greek philosophers. As I've indicated to you in the uh, lecture in the book, 
A group of men known as sophists, that word means wise, had a very negative and skeptical theory of knowledge. And a basic thesis of at least many of them was that man is the measure of all things. Some of them even said such stupid things as, nothing exists, and if it did, nobody could know it, and if they knew it, they could not communicate this knowledge. Brethren, let me realize to you that right today, one of the very crucial issues facing the world, facing the church, is whether or not we believe John 8, 32. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If a man tells me, I believe that John is stronger than Bill, how can I disagree with him? I don't know what he believes. But if he says, I know that Bill is taller than John, when I can see that John is seven feet tall and Bill is five feet tall, then I know he's wrong. We don't really have any trouble with knowledge and belief in ordinary affairs. Somebody says, I think something, or I know it. We know the difference. I am not ashamed to say anywhere in this whole wide world, on anybody's platform, at anybody's university, that I know that God exists. If I do not know that God exists, then I don't know the Bible is his word. How could I? It just doesn't make sense. I cannot not know that God exists and know that the Bible is the word of God. And if I don't know the Bible is the word of God, I cannot know that Jesus is the son of God. And if I cannot know that Jesus is the son of God, then I cannot know that you have to believe in him to be saved. And if I don't know you have to believe in and be saved, I don't know anything about what you have to do to be saved. Now, brethren, that's logical. That's what follows from known truth. I'm not afraid of that. And don't say in your heart, now, Brother Warren's being hard and he doesn't love me because he's saying that. It's because I love you that I'm saying it. It's because I love you that I'm pleading with you to ask to at least be concerned about without my making any kind of charge that every trustee and administrator of our Christian colleges and universities are under a system of honor and trust to operate those schools in harmony with their charters and their bylaws. And if they are committed to teaching the word of God, then we should demand that they demand it of their ad chief administrative, their chief executive officer, and their sub-administrators and every faculty member. Now, brethren, this works just as well for us as it does for anybody. If we want to get all agitated at the University of Texas or some other of the great university systems in this nation, in our state or the high schools or the junior highs or the elementary schools, let us apply the same standard to ourselves. Let us not fly the banner of Jesus Christ and preach the doctrine of Satan. We look back in the annals of history and find men saying, man is the measure of all things. What on earth does that mean? It means, it meant back then just what men mean today when they're talking this humanistic doctrine and in particular the ethical system of values clarification. It means that what each person thinks is right is right for him. If I am convinced that it's right for me to be dishonest, and jip somebody out of something in a business way, it's right for me. I had a public debate with a professor at North Texas State University campus in which he affirmed that the ethical theory of a philosopher from Great Britain named Jeremy Bentham was superior to the ethical system of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of Jeremy Bentham was that every person is under two masters, pleasure and pain, and that every decision you make is guarded by those two things. 
Every decision you make, not only does it tell you those two things tell you what you ought to do, but what you shall do. You can't do otherwise. It's psychological hedonism. Hedonism meaning you strive always for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Psychological means that your mind is so conditioned that you can't do otherwise. I remember talking to a young man from Yale University one time and he said, there isn't a person in the world that can ever do an act that is purely unselfish. He even in the midst of our conversation on being pressed came to the point of saying that he would behead his mother if he thought it gave him personal advantage. Now of course few people who hold this doctrine are willing to go that far. But the truth of the matter is, when you reject God, you have rejected all objective standard. The absolutely no difference if I had a sledgehammer, a rock, a cockroach, and a baby to smash each one of them with that sledgehammer. Man is the measure of all things. You become your own standard. You create your own standard by what you think. It's like some people think, well, everybody has a right to his own interpretation. So therefore, everybody creates his own Bible. It is subjective, not objective. When I say truth is objective, I mean truth is out here. It's not in my mind. It's not created in my mind. It isn't changed by the conclusions that I make about it. This book was here hundreds of years before I was born, before I ever read it or made a decision about it. It taught then just what it teaches now, and the fact that I have studied it and drawn conclusions about it does not make one bit of difference to this. If everything I decide about it is different from what this actually teaches, that doesn't change it. But the basic doctrine of the denominational world is that everybody does create his own Bible. And doctrine of humanism, of values clarification, is that everybody does create his own ethical system. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristippus said, in effect, do everything you can that's fun, that brings uh, sensual, physical pleasure. Do it as soon as you can, as long as you can, and as often as you can. If you get a lot of fun out of fornication, do it as soon as possible, make it last as long as you can, and as often as you can. If you get a great deal of pleasure out of beheading little children or torture and raping them, that's fine. Well, not to be concerned about all of these young women disappearing and being violated and murdered in no telling what fashion. But let me tell you this, there is no person in his right mind that really faces up to things that can admit that's so. He may say it, but he cannot really do it. In the debates with these three men, Dr. Flew from England, Dr. Matson, University of California, Berkeley, one of the great universities of the world. Professor Flew, formerly of Oxford and now of Reading University. When I asked him about if the Nazis captured him during World War II and said, now you kill these Jews, women and men and children as we're doing, or we'll kill you, you would have had the moral obligation to die rather than to join them, and he said, yes, he would. You see? When you come right up down, right down to it, he couldn't face up to the implications of his own doctrine. And yet I have his writings, writings on logic, writings on ethics, in which he says a man who is willing to accept two statements which are contradictory of one another shows that either he is abjectly ignorant or else cares nothing about truth. Now, brethren, for the love of God and Jesus Christ and truth, let us show that we care about truth. Let us not be willing to accept logical contradiction. It's absurd on the very face of it. You cannot even believe a logical contradiction. As a matter of fact, you cannot even think it. How can I think of, for instance, this pen? Suppose I say to you, this pen is black all over and white all over at one and the same time. Now try to think of that. Everybody knows it can't be true. As I told you, my little five-year-old grandson, if I'd tell him his, his tricycle is both in the garage completely or completely out of the garage at one and the same time, he'd grin and look at me and say, oh, granddad, that's not so. We all know that. 
Yet Dr. Flew will say, there was no value before the first human being. See, there's evolution coming in. No value to the first human being, and value is merely invented. It is our own invention. That's all uh, ethics is. In a, in a long essay by Professor W.T. Stace, formerly of Princeton University, he talked about the fact that so many of the so-called great thinkers down through the centuries have said that man's moral systems are his own inventions. Monsieur Jean-Paul Sartre of France, an atheist, said, if there is no God, then anything is permitted. And in that, Monsieur Sartre was right. If there's no God, there isn't any such thing as real right and wrong. This is objective truth. If I say I'm talking about subjective truth, I mean merely what I think is truth, what's in my mind. If there is no God, then there is no objective standard. My idea would be just as good as yours, and you're just as good as mine, and you're as good as anybody's. Now, there are a lot of things in the lecture in the book that I hope you'll read, but I'm not going to try to go down the line and read all of those things. But you can read them. I want you to read them carefully. What I'm trying to preach to you tonight, I don't know, uh, Brother Whitten didn't tell me what time to quit, so I suppose, I mean, I'd just go right on for a while. But uh, where was I anyway? I'm at the stage, uh, I suppose Brother Rice back here is about the same stage. Sometimes we forget where we were. But I, back to the point that if you are an atheist, then it's false that there's an objective standard. If you're an atheist, listen to me carefully, then all ethics is subjective. Now that's just right back to Aristippus, what the, the Cyrenaics philosophers said, that man is the measure of all things. But now, if ethical systems are subjective, what does that mean? It means there can be logical contradiction. It means there can be two men. One will hold that uh, proposition A. Uh, don't let that deceive you a bit. That's just a way of talking about a sentence. Now I say proposition A is true, or sentence A is true. That's what Jones says. But Smith says proposition A is false. Now, if you're an atheist, you'd have to say they're both true. Because each one is a subject. Each one is a measure of all things. Each one can make up his own system. But even atheists recognize that no logical contradiction can be true. Why, they couldn't even meet in their conventions and talk to each other with any sense if they hold that logical contradictions are true. So look what we have. If atheism is true, then subjectivity and ethics is true. But if subjectivity and ethics is true, then logical contradiction is true. But it's false to say that logical contradiction is true. Therefore, by logical reasoning, it means that subjectivity and ethics is false. But if subjectivity and ethics is false, it also follows logically that atheism is false. And let me tell you, brethren, that may sound like I've said very little right there, but I've said enough that if I could convince the world it's true, and it is true, it would literally turn the world upside down. And let me assure you, the Bible teaches just that. That's what Jesus was getting at. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Jesus knew and they knew that couldn't both of those positions be right. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I can think of battle just a few years ago in which brethren in some of our colleges as one would say that we cannot ever really learn truth but can only seek for it. We are saved by seeking for truth, not by gaining truth. Truth is not an instrument of salvation. Even though Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is God's instrument of salvation. But no, we've been told, it is merely something you seek for. You can't ever find it. And that if you claim to have found it, 
If you claim to say, I know that God is, I know the Bible is the word of God, I know the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I know that you must believe in him as the Son of God to be saved, and I know you must believe, believe and obey him to become a Christian, and you must walk in the light of God's word to remain a faithful Christian, then you are arrogant, prideful, self-righteous, and sectarian. That's as false as it can be. It isn't sectarian to say that God Almighty planned in eternity one body of saved people, that everybody that obeys the gospel be added with the Lord to that body, that to spend eternity with him, even though you are a member of the church, you must live a godly life. The Bible makes clear that fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The Bible makes clear that there is holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, Hebrews 12 and 14. Brethren, the Bible teaches that in matters of obligation there must be unity. In matters of option there may be freedom, and in all things there must be love. But we have come to the point, many of us, I'm even afraid there may be more than half of us who's come to the idea to feel that there are no obligatory matters in the Bible. That there isn't anything you really have to be right about. Just be, as we say down here in the Southwest, just be a sort of a good old boy, religiously speaking. Be a person that's nice and kind and benevolent and uh, willing to say, oh well, you hold that and I hold this and you're in that group and I'm in this and it really doesn't matter and we can all go to heaven by different roads. I grew up hearing men preach the ungodliness of that. And I saw early in life that it was true. I saw for myself the Bible teaches it. I know that Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And I know if a man does not believe in Christ and he dies, he will die in his sin. If he dies in his sin, the wages of sin is death and he will suffer eternal punishment. It is simply not the case that the Lord allows us to live any way we will please. Now, happening in the educational system of the United States, stop and ask yourself right now, suppose you had to come up here and tell everybody what you think the purpose of education is anyway. Is it to show a man just how to be a lawyer or a doctor? Is it a professional system? We train men to be uh, CPAs and MBAs and engineers and doctors and lawyers and computer experts and all of that. Is that all it is? Is it merely teaching so we can bring children through grammar school, elementary school, high school to prepare them for college? especially if they're good in sports, to be an All-American and maybe get through somehow or other just to get a piece of paper that says he has a degree. What is education all about anyway? And why are we concerned about it? We don't have the time to go into that. That would be really perhaps more than we would have the time to deal with adequately. But I want to say, so far as we are members of the church are concerned, so far as those of us are concerned with the spread of the kingdom of God, that we need to realize that happening in our schools, I mean in the public schools of this country and in private schools of this country, a job of teaching the young people that there is no God. The basic, really the only argument any atheist has is the so-called problem of evil. If God is good, then he would want only good. He would want no evil. If God is powerful, he would have the power to make it that way. If God is wise or omniscient, he would know how to do it. And so all of those things would mean that if there is God, there wouldn't be any evil. There wouldn't be any pain or suffering. But there is pain or suffering. And therefore it follows that God does not exist. That is a logically valid argument. 
You cannot meet it by saying, well, this doesn't follow from that. The conclusion does follow from the premises. But the catch is it's not a sound argument because not all the premises are true. Now don't tell me that we don't need to do that because the Bible's full of it. I believe I could convince you in a few short minutes that you cannot, if you're willing to study with me, you cannot understand the Bible without being logical. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 12, in regard to the general resurrection, he said, if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is in vain, our faith is in vain, and so on. See, that's really what we call, it's a high-powered expression that simply means that any doctrine that implies a false doctrine is false, but it's called modus talens. If there's no resurrection, then it's false that Christ is raised. If Christ, if it's false that Christ is raised, then our preaching's vain, our faith is in vain. And Paul doesn't go on to give all the explanation. Many times we do that in our regular language. We have to fill in. But it's obvious what needs to be filled in. But our preaching is not in vain. Our faith is not in vain. Therefore, it's false that Christ is not raised. And if it's false that Christ is not raised, it's false that there's no general resurrection. This is the perfect, the perfect logical book. There is not one argument in the Bible from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation where there is an invalid argument where God is presenting his case for man. Nor is there ever an unsound argument. But if you once say, well, I don't have to have the evidence for what I believe, you have espoused existential philosophy. You have rejected God and gone to man's word. And that's what's happening in our universe. That's merely one philosophy. Coming back to the idea of the doctrines that are taught to our children, that they are descendants of some non-human things, all the way back to things that weren't even living. Life came from that which had no life. And things that were not human but living came from things that merely were once nothing but rocks or dirt. And human beings have come from that which was not human. You cannot have a child to really believe that and still believe the Bible. The two don't fit. As I say, nobody believes a logical contradiction. Not really believes it. Now, in this state, of course, in the years I was living in Tennessee, we heard a great deal about the great state of Texas standing strong because the book publishers, the textbooks publishers for our school children. This was a state where they adopted a few. All the teachers had to choose from a few. And Texas is such a big state, sold so many books, that the book publishers would wait and see what Texas demanded. And Texas did not have this situation that you had to just teach one account of the origin of man. But just recently, with the new State Board of Education, it has now been adopted. And how many of us as members of the church with this doctrine that is so far-reaching that it can change the course not only of this nation but the world have hardly even lifted our voices. And yet the Bible says, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That means Christ is the commander. He is the commander-in-chief of an army. But I rather suspect that many of us have concluded that he's a sort of a chief mogul of a social club. Brethren, there are means in this area right here I think about the Dallas Morning News, the circulation of that paper, the Dallas Times Herald, the Fort Worth Star Telegram. We could have in there every week a two-thirds page article explaining the truth of the gospel. 
calling attention to the fact that evolution is an ungodly doctrine and offer to meet in public debate as we have the great and famous almost God regarded Carl Sagan from Cornell University or Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard. When he was challenged by brethren to meet me in public discussion, Dr. Sagan, in spite of the fact that he claimed, as it was reported in Time magazine, that it is a fact. It is a fact, and he offers a challenge to creationists. He wouldn't even discuss it with the news people. A representative from United Press International found me, even though my phone was not listed, found me and talked to me about talking to Dr. Uh, Gould. He said, I don't know anything about it. And the reporter woman said, I'm telling you about it. He said, well, I still don't know anything about it and I don't want to discuss it. But I take scientific magazines in which these men are quoted as if you were reading the words of God Almighty. And they say the, the matter's been settled. There's no more any question about it. Evolution is true. Now, a one time or two time shot's not going to do it, brethren. But we're going to have to gird up the loins of our minds. And as Brother Conley brought to you this morning, I know what he said basically because I heard him yesterday on materialism. We're going to have to learn to give and go into the papers and, con and convince the nation. Time Magazine, 27 million people in eight different languages. And the millions upon millions of dollars we're spending for buildings and how many people, how many nations are being reached by that? We ought to have nice and good buildings, but brethren, the first priority is to meet this kind of thing. Now, I've talked about God briefly and evolution briefly because all the rest of it depends on this. If you do away with God and you show that uh, men, you convince these boys and girls that they're nothing but descendants of apes or some other non-human thing, I don't quibble with them about that. Then, the natural step is, why shouldn't they live in fornication with one another? High school boys and girls whose sexual appetite is at the strongest probably in all of their lives. They don't have the means of holding against drugs, alcohol, sexual promiscuity, and so on and on. I suppose that Brother Whitten means for me to stop, but the fact that he crept up here. <laughs> I wish I had time to say more. I wish I'd had more space in the book. There are more things that need to be said. But really, what needs to be done is the teaching of several courses on this. And I'm glad to say that I know that there are some here in the Brown Trail School of Preaching who know how to do it. Brother Dick Stanio, for instance, is one of the best qualified men in the church in this matter. And how fortunate are the young men who train here under him and other faithful members of this faculty. And I hope that they continue strong and faithful. You know, one of the greatest things of my life is to see a young man that I've had a part in training, to see him go out in the world and be strong and faithful and preach the word without fear of losing his job. And not matter which way the wind is blowing, but to stand for what is right. But at the same time, it breaks my heart more than I could explain to see a young man that I know has great talent and ability to turn from the truth. I could weep before you if I simply let my emotions go when I think I know of some who have done it. I know tonight that I haven't really gotten into all the details of values clarification, but I wouldn't have time to do that. I've taught whole courses on that. But I do think that I've tried to help you to see it's whether or not you believe in God, not merely believe. Belief comes after knowledge. You can't really have biblical faith in God if you don't know God exists. You can't really have biblical faith if you don't know the Bible is the word of God. You can't really believe in Christ if you don't know he's the son of God. Knowledge of God, trust in that knowledge, 
knowledge that the Bible is the Word of God, trust in it to give you the answer to every question of life that really counts. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the way of life. It's as false as it can be to say that man is the measure of all things. And when you've looked at the whole picture, it's summed up in that point. Over here, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him, for he has all authority in heaven and on earth. On the other hand, whatever you may call it, denominationalism, let me say this, brethren, there's not one faithful Christian in any denomination. There is not one denomination that has the approval of God. Every denomination is inherently sinful. I don't say that because I don't love the people involved. I do because I love them. Ambulance drivers drove me 80 miles in one hour to get to a hospital. I didn't jump out of that ambulance and say, why, you so-and-so is you? Why did you do that? They did it because I was dying. And people out here in these denominations, my brethren, are lost. Don't let the fact that they have 10,000 members and a building that costs 50 million deceive you for a moment. Don't allow yourself to be misled into thinking that some of these men that are constantly before the country and kings and presidents and all give them honor that they're preaching the Bible. I plead with you tonight to recognize the great era of humanism in general, of, value, of values clarification in particular, and of the truth of Almighty God. May God help us to be real soldiers, to fight the good fight of the faith to do it with love for all men and for each other, but to stand, so help us God, if we have to stand alone. May God bless you. Now I think that you can see what we mean by the term, the values clarification tragedy in education. It's a, it's a blatant attempt to destroy one's belief in God. It's just that simple, and Brother Warren has done a magnificent job in presenting that very basic definition and analysis of this, uh, this terrible, terrible situation that exists, not only in public education, but tragically in our Christian colleges, universities, and in our Bible classes, that kind of material is being published by our brethren and being taught in our Bible classes. We need to be so very, very careful of what we allow to be taught in our Bible classes and preach from our pulpits. Thank you, Brother Warren, for this very timely and important address. <clears throat>